Hey everyone, uh, would you like to find your Bibles or devices and turn to Luke chapter 22 and we're reading from verses 39 to 65. The end of the chapter to 71. I can do that, yes. So 39 to the end of the chapter. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone throws away beyond them, knelt down and prayed. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, why are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going, on, uh, going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike, out, uh, strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this, and he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who came for him, am I leading a rebellion that you come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me, but this is your hour when darkness reigns. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard, and sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with him, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you are also one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, Man, I do not know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, uh, had spoken to him, before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. The men who were, who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, prophesy, who hit you? and they said many other insulting things to him. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law met together and Jesus was led before them. If you're the Messiah, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, if I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the son of man has been, will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. They all asked, are you the son of man? He replied, you say that I am. Then he said, we do, why, do we need to, uh, why do we need any more testimony? We have heard it from his lips. Thanks so much, Naomi, for reading the Bible for us. Uh, please leave your Bibles open. That's where we're going to be tonight. It's a big passage. I just want to say from the outset, I'm not going to cover it close to everything in it but let's let's pray let's ask God for his help father we thank you so much that you're with us thanks for your word I pray you'd help us to marvel at Jesus at his obedience his love his commitment to us and I pray you'd change us I ask this in Jesus name amen with my boys we sometimes play this silly game called would you rather and Would You Rather is a game where you give two choices and you have to choose one and it often reveals what people value, what they love, what matters to them. So I was in the car with 
one of my boys, Wilbur, yesterday, and I said to him, would you rather all your limbs be legs or all your limbs be arms? Right? I don't know what you would pick, but Wilbur went for legs. And so I'm just imagining my son with like four legs. And I asked him a question. I said, okay, brushing your teeth, going to the toilet. <laughs> How are you gonna do that with four legs? And he went, mm, I don't know. So like, I've thought about this. I think the answer is arms, right? Four arms, like this. And I was a little bit worried in, in starting my talk with this that you would spend the rest of the talk thinking about whether you'd go with four arms or four legs. So can you just put that aside for a second? It's obviously arms, that's what you would pick. The good news is you and I, I don't think would ever have to make that choice. It'd feel impossible to do so. Um, but today, tonight, we're going to get a glimpse into the eternal relationship of God the Father and of God the Son. We're going to see Jesus in deepest distress. And Luke is painting Jesus as an example for us to follow. He's like the, the perfect, faithful disciple, with Peter and the disciples as the anti-example. There's a glimpse of the Christian life here of relationship with God. But until we see Jesus' choice to the would you rather that he's facing, his example will simply be crushing. Until you see the cosmic would you rather that Jesus is facing and what he decides to do in the garden in that moment, then the example is actually of no help. It'll just make you realize that you're not good enough. And so we're gonna start with Jesus's choice to the big would you rather in this passage, particularly in the garden, and then I want us to flesh out five implications of how it should shape our life. All right, so that's where we're headed tonight. Let's, let's start with the passage and start with Jesus' choice. So they've just shared the Last Supper. They head out to the Mount of Olives. We're told in the other Gospels there's a place called the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus goes with his disciples. And in verse 40, he tells the disciples, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Now, I don't think he's talking about the temptation to fall asleep, even though he gets stuck into them later. Luke actually tells us that they're exhausted from sorrow, you know, where sometimes you can be emotionally exhausted and physically you tuck it out. I think the temptation is from verse 31 and 32, where Jesus says to the disciples, Satan's demanded to sift you all, I've prayed for you, Simon, that the temptation is to abandon Jesus. But let's have a look at Jesus' prayer. There, there are very few places in the New Testament where Jesus' prayer is recorded. And we get an intimate conversation between God the Father and God the Son at the greatest moment of distress in Jesus' life. Have a look what he says. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Now, the obvious question is, what is the cup? Remove this cup. Well, the idea of a cup is actually all over the pages of the Old Testament. And I want to read a couple of verses for you from the Old Testament to make sense of what Jesus is asking. And it's also going to help us make sense of what he's about to go through on the cross. All right, so Psalm 75, it says, For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup with foaming wine mixed well, and he pours out from it, and all the wicked of the earth shall drain it to the dregs. So God has a cup that he's going to pour out and the wicked are going to drink it. All right. Let's go Isaiah. Isaiah 51. I'll read a few verses from Isaiah 51. It says, Wake yourself, wake yourself, stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, who have drunk to the dregs the bowl, the cup of staggering. So in Psalms, we're told that there's a cup that's going to be given to the wicked and they'll drink to the dregs. And in Isaiah, we're told that the cup is filled with God's wrath. Just so we're clear, God's wrath is not like, uh, you know, when your parents get really angry and lose their mind. Have you ever had that experience? Like my kids know that experience. Um, and sometimes we think of wrath as like this blowing up, this out of control anger. That's not the idea in the Bible. God's wrath is his settled opposition against sin. He never loses his nana like our parents do or like we do. It's his settled opposition against sin. And in this passage, Isaiah is saying that the people of Israel have drunk 
from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath. And then later in the passage, God says, I have taken from your hand the cup of staggering, the bowl of my wrath, you shall drink no more, and I will put it into the hands of your tormentors. So God's going to pour out his wrath on their enemies. One more passage. This is from Jeremiah 25, verse 15 and 16. Thus the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me, Take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath, and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. They shall drink and stagger and be crazed because of the sword that I'm sending among them. This is a massive insight into the cross and into Jesus himself. In the garden, Jesus is praying to the Father, Father, if you're willing, remove the cup of wrath from me. On the cross, Jesus, the innocent one, drinks the cup of God's wrath down to the dregs, to use the language of the Old Testament. He experiences and receives God's settled opposition against sin for us. He dies as a substitute, the righteous for the unrighteous. If you think back to some Old Testament sacrifices, you've got like the Passover. Jesus is like the greater Passover lamb. He's like the goat on the day of atonement that dies in the place of the people. He's like every sin offering that the Israelites made to God. And so in the garden, Jesus is staring down the terror of the next 18 hours and he's saying, Father, if you're willing, please take the cup of your wrath away from me. He's saying, Father, I don't, I don't want to drink it down to the dregs. Now, physical suffering is in place. Sometimes the cup in the Old Testament is the cup of suffering, but it's pretty much always connected to God's judgment. But something bigger than physical suffering happens on the cross. There's something cosmic, something supernatural. We've got the idea of Jesus suffering in the darkness. He bears our penalty. He receives wrath in our place. It's a big question, he asks. Father, take it from me. Now, look at verse 43, because there's an answer of sorts. <laughs> and there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. I, that seems like no, doesn't it? <laughs> take this wrath from me. No, but I'll send an angel to strengthen you so you can drink it. And I wonder, does it help? Because in verse 44, it's not like he goes, oh, cool, the angel's here now, so I'm fine. In verse 44, it says that he's in agony. Being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, which is remarkable because what's more earnest than father take this cup? That's earnest. He prays more earnestly. And Luke tells us that this agony, this experience of Jesus in the garden as he's praying this is having a physiological effect on his body. Sweat is pouring off him. It's dripping like blood when you cut yourself badly. Now, there are some people who say Jesus actually sweat blood, and there is apparently a medical condition where people can be in such stress that their sweat can be tinged with blood that breaks out of skin and capillaries. It's not what the actual passage is saying. It's, it's not like he got a bit of sweat on his brow because he was stressed. It's, it's literally that it's pouring off him. There's mental and emotional agony that's racking his body, and he begs the Father for another way. Get this, Jesus is free to not drink the cup. There's a choice for him. But he rises and waits for the crowd, and in doing so, he chooses to drink. He doesn't run, he doesn't hide, he doesn't fight. He's arrested, he's mocked, he's beaten. You, you know when they're hitting him and saying, prophesy who hit you? What's crazy is that he could have answered the question. <laughs> Joe Bloggs, son of, son of, I know where you live, I know what you've done. And he doesn't. In fact, at the end of the passage, he speaks to ensure his death rather than secure his freedom. This is all his choice. Remember, this is a guy who told a storm to shut up, and it did. It's a guy who commanded demons, and they obeyed him. He, he commanded sickness to leave. He raised the dead, which means we must not think that Jesus somehow is outsmarted or overpowered. He chooses the cup, and he drinks. And so what I want to suggest is in this moment in the garden, 
there is a cosmic, supernatural, massive, the, the world's biggest would you rather. It's not silly, it's not about legs and arms. And there's two at play here. The first one is, Jesus, would you rather drink the cup and submit to the will of the Father or not drink the cup and not submit to the will of the Father? That's the first would you rather. We see that in his prayer, if you're willing to remove this cup from me, nevertheless not my will but yours be done. And the second one is, would you rather drink the cup and rescue your people or not drink the cup and rescue yourself? Would you rather drink the cup and rescue your people or not drink the cup and rescue yourself? Now, we, we see that in last week's passage as Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is my blood poured out. Now, I, I might willingly suffer some pain to protect people I love, but my enemies, I don't know. Yet in the garden, Jesus in the most significant would you rather in all of the universe's history chooses to drink the cup of God's wrath in submission to the Father to rescue the people that he loves. Get this, he'd rather suffer and have us than not suffer and not have us. Which I want to suggest to you, to us, leaves us with a really big would you rather. And here's the first implication of Jesus' choice, of his drinking of the cup. That Jesus lays down everything for us, that he drinks the cup for us, that he offers his body and his blood, his everything. The obvious response for you and I is to give him our whole selves. Like in drinking the cup, he offers forgiveness, he offers relationship eternal life relationship with him, which means here's a would you rather. Would you rather give him your life, which you can't keep anyway, and get him and everything else thrown in? Or would you rather refuse him your life and lose it all anyway? Now, it's worth noting that nothing that you or I give up to follow Jesus is ours to keep forever anyway. Nothing that we set aside to follow Jesus we were going to keep for eternity. Uh, friends, I hope you're in awe of Jesus tonight. You're in awe of his love. That the, the moments where you doubt it, that you might repent of that. You might be reminded of his grace to sinners like us. And I think the obvious implication is whether it's the first time tonight or the millionth time to say to Jesus, I'm all in, to give him all of yourself. See, Luke wants us to see that until we taste his grace, until we see that he drank the cup for us, his example is actually not all that helpful. It'll just make you think that you've got to work harder to earn his love. But when you see that he drank the cup for you, that's got to affect your life. The first effect is that you give him your life. That's the starting point. All right, so Jesus chooses to drink the cup. That means we should give him our life. I want to show you a couple of implications related to Jesus' example. And if I haven't stressed it clearly enough, you've got to get his grace first before you follow his example. Yeah? So the first part of Jesus' example I think worth following for us here is to pray in our agony. Have a look at verse 44. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Jesus is in the worst moment and the greatest pain. And what does he do? He prays. And I wonder, what do you do in your agony? Where do you go? What do you do to deal with it? Like, as I've reflected on that question, I think I'm quick to try and numb my pain, like anesthetize it. I don't literally, like, inject drugs. Some people do. But I anesthetize with TV or with food, right? It's easy to go to things that are cheap and small comforts. I'm not saying you can't ever enjoy a TV show or good food. I wonder what it is that you go to to ease your agony. It could be TV and food, it could be alcohol, it could be drugs, it could be sex, it could be shopping, it could be exercise. Now, sometimes it's true in our agony, we don't have words. Have you ever been in that space where things are so hard that you actually struggle to form words to pray? 
Some of us just find that hard. And I'd, I'd want to remind you that Romans 8 says that when we can't pray, the Holy Spirit prays on our behalf. Like that there's a groaning before God where we don't have words. That, that's an act of faith. But it's worth noting that Jesus pours out his heart and his desire to the Father. Are you you doing that in your sorrows, in your agony and in your pain? Jesus models a way. Which means maybe in your pain and sorrow, it's worth thinking, where can I find some time and space to spend some time alone with God? To pour out my heart to switch my phone off and get rid of the distractions and tell him my sorrows. Because if the Son of God needed prayer, how can we say that we don't? I want to encourage you to pray for strength and comfort and help. Like, you're not alone. Jesus was abandoned so that you and I would never be. He understands what it is to be in agony and feel stuck. And it's also worth saying, if you have not prayed for a long time, Like maybe it's been months or years and you go through the motions of church and church life, but real honest heartfelt prayer is not something that you've done recently. Can I encourage you to not let guilt or shame stop you? Don't believe the lie that were you to show up before the throne of grace that God would be like, oh, it's about time. (laughs) Rather, you'd be met with grace. He drank the cup down to the dregs. He'll turn his face towards you, so pray. Pray in your agony. There's the first part of Jesus' example worth following. Here's here's the second part. We should submit to God's will. That's really easy, yeah, isn't it? Just submit to God's will. Just do that. (laughs) That's hard, isn't it? See, Jesus in this moment, he says to God, here's what I want. I don't want to drink the cup, but I want your will more. Now, how can he say that, especially in agony? Jesus did have the advantage of an eternal relationship with the Father. That's a pretty significant advantage. He knew the Father's goodness for all eternity past. This was a plan that the Father and the Son had put into effect with the work of the Spirit. This is God's plan for all eternity. How do we say that? How do we say to God, not my will but yours? Sometimes we want to not engage our brains in those moments and we want to feel things. I want to encourage you to engage your brain We remember Jesus' choice to drink, which means he must love us. We remember that the cross reminds us that God can bring the worst, bring the best out of the worst. He can take the worst and bring good out of it, which helps us to imagine that whatever is going on in your life, whatever reasons God has for it, it can't be that he doesn't love you. It can't be that he's against you because Jesus drank the cup down to the dregs. We remember that God's will for our lives is not just for comfort and ease and for us to get exactly what we want all the time, but rather his will for our life is that we would grow in dependence on him, that we grow to love him, that we trust him more, that we grow more in terms of our Christ-likeness. And when a person does that and gets that Jesus has drunk the cup to the dregs, you start to imagine that God is giving you exactly what you would ask for if you knew everything that he knew. He's giving you exactly what you would know you need if you knew everything that he knew. Doesn't mean you can't complain. You absolutely can. Doesn't mean you can't lament. I remind you earlier in the year, we looked at wrestling with God. You can pour your heart out and complain. But that Jesus is our substitute, that he prayed in his agony and submitted perfectly for us means he died for all the times that we don't submit to God's will. And so Christian, will you trust him in the trials and sorrows of your life? He did drink the cup for all the times we fail, and that helps us to trust him and submit. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, one of the biggest arguments against belief in God is pain in the world. And C.S. Lewis helpfully said that pain is God's megaphone to the world that we're in need of a saviour. I just ask you to consider that if your life was only ever perfectly easy and comfortable all the time, would you ever consider that you have need of God or that anything's wrong in the world? Could it be that pain is one of the ways in which God draws us to himself, knowing that without it we wouldn't come? So Jesus, he teaches us to pray in our agony, to submit to God's will. Here's the next one, to pay the cost of faithfulness. 
A lot of you are younger, so you probably don't watch free-to-air TV anymore, but maybe you've seen this ad. Have you ever seen those ads for superannuation where they say, compare the pair? And like two people are talking about their super, because that's what we all do all the time, don't we? Oh, well, what's your super fund? This is my super fund. Oh, compare the pair. And then we do something with our hands, and someone's like, I got $60,000 more in 40 years' time. Um, I think we're meant to compare the pair, Jesus and Peter, in this passage. They're actually both on trial at the same time. Peter, before we judge him too harshly, it's, he's there. Where are the others? They ran away. One dude ran away naked. <laughs> Peter's there. He's watching. He's zealous. The other Gospels tell us that Peter was the one who pulled out the sword and chopped off the, the high priest's servant's ear. He was ready to die for Jesus, to fight for Jesus. Yeah, I, I kind of think it's funny to imagine that the high priest's servant goes back covered in blood and someone says to him, hey, what happened to you? And they're like, oh, one of the disciples of Jesus chopped my ear off. And they're like, but your ear's on your head. Yeah, I know. Like, he put it back on. <laughs> he healed it. Like, Jesus, even in that moment, is protecting his disciples. He's teaching them the way. He's being faithful. So Peter's there, and in the heat of the moment, in the pressure and in his tiredness and in his fear, he fails tremendously, just as Jesus said. He is unfaithful as Jesus is faithfully paying the cost. He chooses the cup despite the cost. Uh, for those of us who are Christians, I wonder, are you avoiding paying the cost of following Jesus? If you're not a Christian, you should know that there is a cost to following Jesus. Jesus does not say, if anyone would come after me, he must take up his couch and follow me. Like, he never says that. He says he must take up his cross. There's a cost to following Jesus. Again, you won't lose anything that you could keep, but there's a cost. And if you're a Christian, are you willingly paying it? In your workplace or at uni or at school, in your family? Are you avoiding paying the cost? Maybe by downplaying your faith? Maybe by hiding or lying like Peter. Maybe by devoting yourself to a different kingdom. Devoting yourself to other things more than Jesus. Maybe in how you use your time or your money. It could be that you're giving Jesus lip service but denying him by your life. Jesus drank the cup for our unfaithfulness and for our Peter moments, which all of us have. And I think this is meant to grow in us steel and conviction and strength. Like I want to encourage you, if there are times where you are nervous about your faith and you downplay it, most of us have those experiences. Will you let the fact that Jesus drank the cup for all of your failures down to the dregs encourage you to be honest and open about your faith? It could be tomorrow in your workplace sharing that you went to church. Just see what happens. Could end in silence, could end in belittling and mocking. It could mean missing the promotion or your job. It could mean the disapproval or rejection of your family. It could mean ending that relationship. It could mean that people don't like you or mistreat you. It never means that we go in hot and angry, ready for a fight. It always means that we would be kind to those who treat us as enemies. But he paid the price for our sin in full and calls us to pay the cost of following him. So there's Jesus as our example. He drinks the cup to the dregs. He prays in his agony. He submits to God's will, and he's faithful despite the cost. There's one final lesson here I want us to look at, and it's, it's from Peter, one implication of Jesus drinking the cup. It's interesting. All four Gospels contain Peter's denial. Did you know that? And there's lots of differences between the Gospels, but Peter's denial of Jesus is in every one. It's clearly really important to the story of the Gospel. And that Jesus chose the one who denied him publicly three times to be the leader of his church, the early church, that says something big, doesn't it? Jesus chose the disciple who had failed in the biggest way to be the leader. Why? I think he chose the bloke who'd most tasted grace. And one thing about Luke's account is that there's a bit of drama in here, the timing of the passage. Let me read from verse 60. This is Peter's third denial. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, 
the rooster crowed and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Like you can imagine that in a movie, can't you? Like Peter saying, I don't know who he is. Jesus' face, close up, right? Like you can imagine it. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he'd said to him before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. He, he leaves and weeps bitterly. I want to ask you a really important theological question. How do you imagine Jesus' face towards Peter? What's on his face? Is it anger? Is it disapproval? Is it disappointment? Is it, I told you so? (laughs) Is it possible that he looked at Peter with love? With longing? See, look at verse 31. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. The question of his faith failing, is that about denying Jesus or is that about what he'll do with it afterwards? See, he'd already prayed. He knew Peter would deny him and he knew that he'd turn back. I wonder, for those of us who are Christians, what do you do when you sin? What do you do when you feel deep shame? What do you do in those moments where your sin causes you to feel such shame and guilt that you would weep bitterly? Do you ever feel that? Have you ever felt that? Could be from denying him like Peter. It could be sexual sin or adultery or drunkenness or gossip or slander or shame. Whatever it is, what do you do in those moments? If you've never felt any guilt or shame over the last few years, I'd say, what's up with that? What do you do? See, that Jesus drank the cup means that we should run to him for grace and forgiveness. See, so often we flee. Sometimes in our pride we think, I should have known better. And so we just smash ourselves as if our salvation was always dependent on our performance. Sometimes we don't believe the gospel. We think that Jesus drank the cup of God's wrath down to the dregs, but left a few little chunky bits in there, and those chunky bits was our sin. (laughs) That was the penalty that we deserve, and now God's going to tip those on us. Sometimes we're just so deeply ashamed we can't bear to have Jesus look at us, and and it makes sense, but I want to remind you that it's a denial of the gospel. It's a denial of what Jesus did on the cross, He knew what Peter would do and still drank the cup. He knew everything that you would do and he still drank the cup. And when that affects your heart and your life, only a fool would hear that and go, oh, cool, I'll go and sin more. No way that's the effect it has. Because here's the truth. You and I, all of us this week at some point, we will sin, won't we? Anyone want to put their hand up next Sunday and say, I nailed this week, right? It's just not going to happen. Some of us will sin in small ways that don't bother our souls. Some of us might sin in big ways that deeply bother our souls. Some of us will feel deep guilt and shame. And if and when that happens, and it will happen in your life at some point, I want to encourage you to come back to him. There's no dregs in the cup. (laughs) He bore the wrath of God for you in full Come back for more grace. You can always come back like Peter, turn again. Could it be that Jesus' face is already turned towards you in that moment with love and longing and welcome, even when it comes to the sin that you're most deeply ashamed of? See, in the garden, in that cosmic would you rather, Jesus made it very clear that he would rather drink the cup of God's wrath in full to save you rather than not drink it and save himself. And so if you're a Christian, will you believe that afresh? Will you believe that he really does love you? Will you let it shape your heart and your life? Will it move you to give all of yourself to him, to pray in your sorrows, to submit to his will in the hard things of life? To run to him in your guilt, to pay the cost of faithfulness. And if you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, will you give your life to the one who gave you his? 
He's so gracious. He's so worthy. There's no king like him. And nothing that you'll give up for him you could have kept anyway. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for sending your son to drink the cup of your wrath for us in full. Thank you that he lived the life we could never live. Thank you that he died the death we deserve. We confess that so often, those of us even who've been Christians for years and years, we, we struggle to believe that you're that good. We struggle to believe the gospel. So please help us tonight, even right now by your spirit, to experience and feel and taste something of your love. To see that Jesus' face might be turned towards us in welcome and love and longing. And may that help us to pray in our agony and to trust you and submit to your will in our lives and be willing to pay whatever it costs to follow Jesus. Forgive us for running from you in our shame and guilt, just like Adam and Eve did. Help us to run to you for more grace. Thanks for Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen.